This is Starry Night, an iconic painting from the 19th century. This is the Golden Gate Bridge, an iconic bridge from the 20th century. And this is an iconic achievement from the 21st century, a work of art created by an artificial intelligence. I'm Dr. Eric Risser, and I'm here to tell you about the future of AI in the creative industries and how Artematics is working towards that future. But before I get into that, let's start with a problem. So first there was the pixel, then came the polygon. After that, it's actually just been a lot more pixels and polygons. You see, art creation has gone through an evolution over the last 20 years, and as the quality has increased, so have the costs. And it's not just the main characters we care about, it's all this other stuff in the background that's so expensive. This has gotten so bad that Grand Theft Auto V took five years and cost $280 million to create. Destiny, six years, $330 million. The $80 billion video game industry spends over 60% of their average project budget just on digital media creation. The reason is that it's still an almost entirely manual process. Even though it's gone into the digital world, it hasn't gotten any of the, the core uh, advantages of being, being digital, being computerized, which is automation. So that essentially is the why. That is why AI is going to be so disruptive for the entertainment space because at the moment, the cost and the time of making 3D content is their largest challenge. If we look at a graph of content creation uh, supply versus demand, so supply is the gray one, demand is the orange one. Um, so supply is going up. Human beings are being born. More people are going to art school now than ever before. Uh, the tools are, that are out there, the, the manual ones, are getting better. You know, what used to be three button clicks is now one button click. You know, small efficiency gains, you know, the, the, that kind of two or three percent stuff. Uh, but the demand is going up exponentially, and that's because, you know, Moore's Law, computer power, computer memory is going up exponentially. So worlds are getting bigger. Everybody is trying to one up each other, and teams are just getting ridiculous. So. Excuse the automatic slide, but um, but replace automatics with creative AI. <laughs> this is going to uh, this is basically going to fill the gap. So this is going to replace um, kind of that grunt work that that's currently being outsourced overseas, um, but make it effectively infinite. So that's why creative AI is going to be huge for the creative industry. What is creative AI though, and what does that mean for the creative industries? So technologically speaking. It is computer graphics mixed with machine learning, mixed with computer vision. That's effectively creative AI. Um, but that's not very descriptive, so let me tell you about another way with zombies. So these three heads in the bottom were created by a human being. They're examples. We gave those examples to an AI and said, okay, this is all you know of the world AI, aside from some other pre-training. And then the AI said, okay, well, is this kind of what you were going for? And then the human artist says, yeah, cool. Um, here is a small patch of the earth that was scanned um, using various scanning technologies, given to a creative AI, and then it generated a whole landscape. Uncertain how all of this is working? Well, that's great, you're halfway to the answer. Creative AI runs on uncertainty. Or if you think about it another way, Imagine you were a newborn baby seeing your first ever human head. There is so much new information here for you. There's two eyes, a nose, a mouth, the shape of the head. You've never seen anything like it before. Now, let's say you're seeing your second ever head, and let's say it's a zombie. There's still a lot of new information. You've never seen blood before. You've never seen scars before. But you have seen two eyes, a nose, a mouth, the shape of the head before. Now let's say you see your third ever human head and your second ever zombie head. There's still new information. There's different scars, different blood splatter, but effectively it's still a human head. You're becoming less uncertain over time of what a human and also what a zombie is. So you guys have probably seen a lot of graphs in your lives, but I'm pretty sure you've never seen the zombie graph. So here we are plotting uh, zombies, <laughs> or if you think about it another way, unique information over total information. And what we find is that as we add in, you know, data, 
uh, we find this very distinct curve forming. I call it the uncertainty curve. And you find this anytime you add data that follows a category, be it zombies, cars, dogs, hipsters, really anything that you can put some kind of a, a category or rule set behind. So the goal of a creative AI is basically to be given enough information to bootstrap this process to get an idea of what you're going for and then to uh, kind of walk a tightrope where it needs to, uh, it needs to cr inject stochastics. It needs to inject enough randomness, creativity, whatnot, that it creates stuff that's new, but not too new, because otherwise it breaks the category and you just get crazy stuff. So that's why creative AI is going to be huge for the entertainment industry. That's what creative AI is, and how is it going to actually be used? in the creative industries. Well, before I get into you know, how you will use creative AI for you know, generating worlds and, and revolutionizing the space, let's talk a little bit about what people are currently doing today. So today, if you're building a big virtual world, you have two options. You have manual and procedural. Manual is human artists doing everything the way human artists have always done everything. Um, and procedural is essentially writing code to make art. So it's kind of the faux automation that we sort of have today. So procedural is a highly technical process. This would be what a typical procedural uh, workflow would look like. An artist puts images in and then has math functions and various image processing operations. So this is actually a program. Artists are actually writing programs that make art. They do it through this kind of drag and drop, connect the dots workflow. Um, but this can actually be compiled directly into GPU shader code. Um, so it's good for some things. Uh, there are definitely a place for, for uh, program, programmatical controllability in, in art. Uh, but it's not a silver bullet, and it can get out of hand pretty quick. Now, let's say we're talking the, uh, the manual approach. Well, while that's become computerized, while we have Photoshop, we have all these tools that give you efficiency gains, you know, you can save your work, go back, you don't have to clean up paint. At the end of the day, it really hasn't changed. So 500 years ago, when Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel, he had a little wooden stick where he did this. And today, 500 years later, if you are a digital artist creating a digital Sistine Chapel, you will have a little plastic stick doing this. So it's really not that different. Um, so where does creative AI come into play here? Well, there's a third workflow that's starting to emerge called the scan-based workflow. So the idea behind scanning is it is kind of addressing the problem that the costs and the timelines are going up exponentially. So instead of writing programs to make art or having humans draw everything from scratch, well, at the end of the day, like if you're making, if you're making a virtual world, why don't you just go into the real world and scan what you already have and, and get yourself 90% you know, of the way there. And there's various tools that have been coming out in the last few years to address this. So reality capture and photo scan can just turn regular cameras into 3D scanners by taking a lot of pictures from different areas. The problem with scanning is that it's not like, it's not a silver bullet either. It's not a turnkey solution. Whenever you scan something, there's usually a lot of work that then goes into scanning, like cleaning up the scan process. This could be because like, you know, let's say you're scanning me, like with a lot of pictures, the area under my armpit would probably be occluded, so that would be a void area that you'd then have to go in and touch up manually. Um, if one of those photos was out of focus, you might have a big blurry patch on my face, you know. Um, if you're going to do some kind of a, a surface like the floor, it won't tile. And at the end of the day, all materials need to tile. Uh, maybe there is some gum stuck to the floor that you need to remove. Bottom line, artists that have adopted the scan-based workflow for efficiency gains kind of hate their job and because they're wasting a lot of time basically being Photoshop technicians. Because this isn't a creative thing they're doing. They're just cleaning up uh, damaged scans. So I mean, this process would look a lot like this. You start with something on the left. It doesn't tile. There's not enough of it. You want something on the right. Um, so we see Creative AI being kind of, a, kind of a sister technology to scanning to create a new, to kind of complete that into an example-based workflow. So the idea behind an example-based workflow is it's kind of like the holodeck from Star Trek workflow, where you go in, you give the computer some examples, you say, this is roughly the kind of seed information I want, but here's how I want you to put it together. This is kind of, and then you give like kind of a curative explanation to the computer of how you want it to tweak things and then it iterates rapidly for you. So a perfect example of an example-based workflow is, again, scan from the real world, like I showed you before. 
Um, PBR material, so kind of a, a 3D surface that interacts with light the correct way, but there's not a lot of information to go on there. All the rocks are very distinct. It's, it's really quite a small patch, very, very data rich. Um, and if an artist were to like manually try and make this, it would, it would be a week of work. Uh, here's another example of a scene that was scanned from the real world, and this is kind of what, looks, what it looks like if you just take a raw real world scan and just chuck it straight into a game engine. Um, it doesn't look realistic at all. It tiles horribly, there's light attenuation artifacts, new resolution issues, uh, you know, it's missing various like physically based maps. So we pointed an AI at it and just said, hey, make this look real. Do basically what an artist would do. Here is actually an example not made by us. This was made by uh, a tech artist at Havoc, now Microsoft, named Pete McNally. He uh, used photogrammetry to scan a, a rock wall in, in Dublin. Went in 3D Studio Max, made a warpy cylinder. Then used Artematics to basically put that rock wall on that cylinder, wrote a blog post called The uh, Realistic Cave in Under 60 Minutes, and it went kind of, it went like viral within the, the art communities. Because um, this would have normally taken like days to do manually. Uh, here's another example from Pete, which I particularly like because, you know, it shows how much you can do with so little. So he was waiting for the bus one day and he was like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and take a quick scan of just whatever's in front of me. And he said he had this in an unusable folder on his computer until he got Art Engine, you know, that's our product. And he was like, yeah, let's see what I can do. And, and he said he wasn't expecting much because the only usable data he had was this bit that he cropped out. And even then it wasn't that usable, because if you see like there's little bright bits where like the sun was coming through trees and highlighting things, and there's like little bits of like green clovers that are sticking through. But you know, he masked it out anyway and, and ran it through the machine and got what he was generally happy with on, on the other end, like a usable material that he was able to uh, actually throw into a game engine and you know, fit his purposes. So, this image here, pretty much all of the materials except for that soldier front and center, that hero asset, were generated using creative AI. Uh, this scene, same deal. This was actually scanned from a real forest. This was from Unity's, uh, Unity's um, engine demo at last year's Game Developers Conference to show off how you can use Unity for this new scan-based workflow and to groom all of the materials they used Art Engine. So now I've kind of shown you how you can take real world scans and, and basically just you know, go from that 90% mark to the 100% mark very quickly. But the real value is where you give artists more control over that. It's not just to make this better button. So we were talking to uh, the Ghost Recon team at Ubisoft and we showed them a new feature we were working on on model texture synthesis. So the idea is instead of just making a texture in image space, you put it onto a 3D shape. Um, and they're like, well, can it do camo? And we're like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so they're like, prove it. We went online, we grabbed a camo texture, and we went and synthesized it. And we asked them, you know, why, why camo? And they said, oh, because we spent two years manually painting camo onto soldiers because I had never actually played Ghost Recon, but I guess it's a lot of soldiers wearing stuff that looks like this. So, yep, here's an example where we have this input dude here, and he's got like kind of a boring, just blue cloth, and we just went online, grabbed a few different camos, and just said, okay, synthesize directly on the model just where there is the blue cloth, and yeah, now we really quickly, easily got a lot of variation. Um, so th that's kind of what Art Engine does today, but you know, there's so much you can do with creative AI when you point it you know, to artists and, and, and kind of give them control, like fine grain control over it. So we're very excited about example-based painting in the future. So here's a, here's a research paper result where you have some kind of an input at the top and you kind of give it some reference sketches of saying, like, this is what an edge looks like, this is one texture, this is another texture. And then you can just draw like quick sketches of what you want and then you let the AI fill in those textures. Here's an early prototype that we put together of the same kind of deal. So targeting that synthesis, targeting, you know, directing that creative AI, giving that human level controllability to it. Um, starting with something coarse and getting something fine. 
Beyond creating new things, uh, creative AI will have a huge impact in this sector because right now, well, okay, a unique thing about digital art is again, computers are going up exponentially in terms of memory. So there's this mountain of old data that's not actually usable anymore because the standards changed, the, uh, the resolutions changed, and it just looks like crap, to be frank. So Creative AI can go in and make all this old stuff new again. So we see this input texture here that we scraped out of, uh, I believe, World of Warcraft, ran it through a neural network that then hallucinated the details back in. So it's kind of like in those cop shows where they're like, enhance that license plate, and then they just magically do. Uh, so yeah, make old things new again. Sometimes you have content you like, but it doesn't really fit the artistic style you want. Well, we can do that as well. So here's an example of uh, taking an old texture. So it's low resolution, and at the end of the day, it's just not the right style. So we want a cartoony version of this exact texture, and we pointed Creative AI at that. So here's an old model we got off of TurboSquid, which is kind of a repository of old stuff that people then go in and tweak. Um, we generally like the castle, we like the content, but the textures are old, they don't fit modern PBR standards, and basically it's just not the style we wanted. So we can go in, find examples of the style we like, and just point, uh, point those two things together and repurpose this old asset into a new one. So now, again, you know, it's a cartoony World of Warcraft style castle or just, you know, a realistic one for, I don't know, some game, Zelda. <laughs> in any case, here's a, here's a zoom in of, uh, of Cobblestones, new version. And it goes beyond just building 3D worlds. So when we say, you know, the entertainment industry, that's not just video games. Um, there's also a mountain of film and broadcast uh, content that is now 99.9% .9 obsolete. And even if it wasn't, in two years when everyone owns a high dynamic range television, it will be obsolete again. <laughs> um, and also, all of this obsolete content is jamming up about 60% of the global internet bandwidth. So we can take these same kind of technologies that you can use to build 3D worlds and make old art new again and apply it to these problems where we have all this old, crappy, uh, highly compressed data. We want to kind of bring it back to its original source. We've got low resolution uh, images either because they're old TV shows that were like 340 by 280 resolution and now we need them to be 4K or 8K or whatever. Um, and again, we have all this low dynamic range uh, content because TVs couldn't display you know, that level of color depth, that level of luminance, cameras couldn't capture it properly. Um, we can hallucinate that color depth back in for the new generation of TVs. So I think we're going to see these technologies both on the, uh, the, the pre-baking side, where you just automatically remaster everything that's ever been made, but then at the edge of device as well. So with inference chips, with, with neural network compute chips coming out on pretty much every uh, mobile device, I think we're going to see this happening you know, in real time on the edge of, of the network uh, to help with that bandwidth burden. So think Netflix. Uh, where it doesn't buffer and you don't get those weird blocky artifacts in, in the black region sometimes, and yeah, everything is awesome. Any questions? How does it work? Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a big question. <laughs> um, so there's a bunch of different, so. That was how does it work, by the way. <laughs> Well, let, let's go with the neural network variety because I feel like everyone loves neural networks right now. Um, so a lot of this boils down to image to image translation or generation networks, uh, which kind of, which the latest style would be adversarial uh, variants. So that would be, let's say you've got a category of a thing or, or well, actually up-res is a perfect example because that's trained adversarially. So you've got lots of high-res stuff and you can down-res it. So now you've got image-to-image -image translation. You have a low-res source, and you want to uh, get that high-res back. But it's an ill-posed problem, because for every low-res thing, there's you know, thousands of, po or theoretically infinite, you know, high-res things that could be down res to that. It's kind of like when you add five numbers together and you get a final product, you can't go back the other way. Um, 
so historically, using signal processing, what you get is some average opinion. You, know, you try and make the sharp edges sharper, the gradients blurrier. Um, but with neural networks, what you can actually do is start to bake in a memory. So give it a ton of training data, millions of examples. And what happens is if it sees faces, so for this, like it sees faces, it kind of, I don't want to say knows, but it kind of has eye features baked in. So if at a course level, it recognizes similar feature, then as it traverses through that convolutional neural network, it actually starts re-hallucinating hairs and irises and all that good stuff. And what's really cool about the way we train this is uh, we use something called an adversarial strategy, where we have two networks that fight a war against each other. So one that's trying to generate counterfeits and another one that's trying to detect whether that is a counterfeit or not. So they kind of train in tandem and make each other better by trying to fool fool each other, fool, one fools, the other one catches. And then there's like a lot of other explanations for other flavors of, of things, but yeah. Take another question. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. What other applications are there apart from games and movies? So, <sighs> too many. <laughs> too many to, to even keep track of. But I'd say the other big market opportunity right now, uh, or at least where, where a lot of interest for us comes from, are actually furniture, industrial design, automotive, aerospace companies. So, an interesting thing happened to us on the Artomatix journey. About two years ago, we did a big marketing push out into games, and we had a furniture company reach out to us. And you know, you know when you have those meetings where you're like, well, that's weird. Um, we got on the phone with them. Within 50 minutes, we made a deal. Uh, they scan a whole lot of fabric. Everybody who makes anything in the real world needs to get some kind of a digital doppelganger of that up in WebGL, up in a VR, AR app, because if you do, your sales go up about 20%, we now know. So there's currently a, a gold rush where everybody who makes stuff needs to make a digital version of that stuff. Um, and again, this is interesting because historically, people who would use Photoshop, people who would use artistic tools were artists, but not anymore. We have this new category of, of user base emerging called, I, we call the, the scan technician. So what's different here is these, like, a lot of artists are becoming scan technicians, but you don't necessarily need to be an artist. Like, you aren't trying to make anything creative, you're just trying to fix a scan. Um, and, yeah, there's just, the demand has, you know, quincentupled uh, for 3D artists due to this new scan technician category. If I have a studio operation and I employ X number of people to basically do the scanning and the, and the improvement and the fixing, uh, in terms of people hours or people days, what level of difference can I achieve to my resource base if I fully adopt your platform? Gotcha. So the kind of stuff that we work on, um, so like, you know, right now we don't do animation, we don't do 3D modeling yet or world building, you know, we just do the, the material creation. But for material creation tasks, we're looking at about an 80% uh, time gain. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about where, where your product is in terms of people actually using it just now and um, the adoption and your rollout going forward? Oh, sure. So, you know, it's still early days, but I, I guess our very braggable customer would be uh, Beanox. So they're an Activision studio and they work on a franchise called Call of Duty. Uh, where I, I don't really know what the latest games are like, but I, I know it's like an army thing, like you shoot stuff and war. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Beanox is pretty cool. Um, and it's because, you know, they're switching from that, that procedural to that photogrammetric pipeline, and the tools that are out there are basically turning all of their artists into technicians, and, and they hate that. Um, so yeah, that, that's where we're seeing that being like a huge validation point. Um, I'd say the other big adoption would be uh, would be a uh, a, a, a Michigan-based furniture company that's trying to put their whole portfolio online and just needs a lot of couch like general cloth textures to just be made tileable and grown out and hit modern you know rendering standards. We're doing a ton of trials at the moment. I mean, I, I'm I'm not super in the weeds with that. That would be Joe, our CEO back there, who's who's more focused on on shepherding all those deals and that process. Um, so I, I mostly just know the customers that like 
are on Discord with me and then they make comments about like a bug or a feature request or something or just showing us a cool thing they made. Uh, so that's really more like the user, like the customer relationship that I would, I would shepherd. Okay, just, just two questions. One of them, uh, assume that the, the amount of, the more data you feed to the, to the engine and to the algorithm, the, the better it becomes. Mm -hmm. so, so beside your algorithm uh, and your unique um, neural network that you're using, uh, what will give you an advantage to other people coming to the market is that you have access to volumes and volumes of that data before anyone else. Yep. So, so first question is how you achieving that? Or what is the strategy to achieve that? And the second is, what is the revenue model? You know, how, how the company gets paid for the service? Um, but yeah, no, tra training data is actually as important as the, as the algorithms themselves. Uh, so some training data is easy, like, like the up-res stuff. Um, you, we just bought like a, a 4,000 euro camera and we just got and take pictures of stuff and because and, it's quite easy to get your down-res. Now, we're, we're currently uh, finalizing, actually GDC's in two weeks, so we're finalizing a big announcement for that, which is uh, PBR material generation. So another classically ill-posed problem where, you know, you take a picture of, you know, say this floor, um, there's actually a lot going on in this floor in terms of microstructures, the way it interacts with light, uh, so much more than y you get in just a photograph. Like if you were to render in 3D, just a photograph, it would look dead. Like if you look at it, there are little shiny bits where the light hits it just right and others that aren't because there's little grooves and, you know, wood actually has subsurface scattering going on where it's actually different you know, molecules as you go deeper into it and photons scatter in different ways. So we built a training set uh, that lets us invert that problem. So it has all of this really rich information uh, that we then render down into an image and we learn how to invert that similar to how we do up-res. Uh, and that was a real pain to gather. <laughs> um, yeah, other things like, like uh, SD to HDR conversion we just had to bite the bullet and we are now generating an SD to HDR training set uh, where we just have to go out and, and take very uh, time consuming HDR movies of things with an SD equivalent to, to learn that inversion. Uh, at the moment, we're, we're trying to work through a deal with a furniture company uh, where we, uh, where we're, you know, I, I've kind of told Joe, if, if we could do like, if we could do some services for a furniture company that just wants to make a lot of their scans tileable, but their scans are like from an X-Rite scanner, so these things would be like the size of a, an American refrigerator and they cost 200K and they like, I, I don't even know what kind of crazy stuff they do to these things, like these materials, like if they shoot it with gamma rays or something, but like they can get true BRDF information, like actual reflectance models of how light interacts with those atoms perfectly. Uh, if we could get that data, um, yeah, I could train a neural network to like invert that and, and do kind of like a, an approximate like TAC7 scanner and, you know, possibly kind of kind of go from having x right be, you know, kind of compete with kind of x right as a low-cost competitor. Um, so yeah, there are various ways we get training data. Um, <laughs> and I mean, there's also a lot of nice stuff out there just from the academic communities, just kind of harvesting that. But yeah, training data is tough. Um, reading here, 70 trial customers after you launched your first product at GDC in San Francisco. How many of those have or might turn into ongoing customers? Oh, so like the ones from last year? Yeah. Uh, five. Or how many have? Five of them. I mean, you happy with that? Unhappy with that? Oh, what, I mean, what, 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 what stopped the other 65? Gotcha. Uh, very pedestrian things, honestly. Um, so mo mostly bugs, uh, stability issues, UI, UX, um, all the normal stuff. I mean, when you come out with kind of a prototypey beta MVP, you end up, you know just having issues you need to work through. Like you can only take it so far through internal QA, especially when you're building, you know, quite a technical and sophisticated product for professionals. You kind of just need to work with those professionals to harden it and, and polish it. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we, we've been learning from each of those trials and improving upon the product. And yeah, we're pretty excited about this latest batch and going to GDC in two weeks. Uh, like the feedback we've been getting from people is, is really quite nice. Like, this time a year ago, we were having like as pedestrian things as like installation issues. So those first five were really like the people that scan stuff all day and this pain point was so huge that they were willing to deal with the pain point of early stage software.